Good evening and welcome again. My name is Jessica Colligan and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. It's my pleasure to introduce you to this evening's speakers, Brendan Coffey and Father Jerry Blaschek. Brendan is a theology and English teacher at Fairfield Prep and he's currently in the Regency stage of his Jesuit formation. Father Jerry is our Vice President for Mission and Identity and tonight he'll be interviewing Brendan about his personal journey as a Jesuit. We do ask that you please keep your microphones muted during the presentation just to minimize distraction for our speakers and our other guests. And now I will turn things over to Father Jerry. Thank you, Jess. Did you notice that Jess identified Brendan as being in the Regency stage of our formation? She didn't, quite pointedly, didn't identify what stage I'm in. I think that would be pre-retirement, Jess, or pre-senility, but uh, thank you for being so gracious. Those of you who have been following the series over the last couple of months know that this series is the brainchild of the Fairfield University Alumni Affairs Office. The alumni affairs folks, Jess among them, the team, thought about the needs of how, how we could possibly in this period of COVID reach out and stay connected to our alumni and alumni and what kinds of topics might be interesting uh, to that group of alumni and alumnae. And uh, they came up with the notion that in this time of COVID, everyone is perhaps reaffirming or identifying their own interest in spirituality. What matters? What is ultimate? What gives direction to people's lives? Where do they find their hope? How do they structure their lives in such a way that they find purpose and meaning and happiness uh, that's not just ephemeral? And so they came up with the genial idea of interviewing Jesuits. And it's been my privilege to uh, be the interviewer for a few of my confreres, Father Paul Rourke, our director of campus ministry, and Father Michael Duty, whom many of you know, uh, in, who works in student affairs. And now it's my great privilege to interview Brendan. Uh, this time, uh, since Brendan has been, in, he's into his second year of working at Fairfield Prep, the invitation to, uh, to participate in our series was extended to folks who are involved in the Murphy Center and to families who are involved uh, at Fairfield Prep and Brendan's colleagues. I, I told Brendan that a number of his colleagues from Prep have seated very embarrassing questions to me. Uh, and Elliot Gualtieri is laughing at me as I uh, have an announced that. But Brendan, I promise you, uh, I have to live with you and you'll be pushing my wheelchair in future years. So uh, I keep those sorts of considerations in mind. So <laughs> let me stop babbling. Uh, the last time we were together, we met with Father Michael Duty, And you will remember, those of you who know him, <clears throat> that I began by asking Michael how it was that he came to know the Jesuits. Mm. And of course, it was right here on the Fairfield campus. Michael came as an undergraduate to Fairfield University. And now uh, 50 years later, and 50 years and more, he's returned. Brendan, where was it that you first encountered the Jesuits? I know it was not as much as you love Fairfield and you may like Father Duty be here after your 50th anniversary. You may spend the next 60 years of your life at prep. That'd be a great thing. Yeah. But I don't think you met the Jesuits at Fairfield. Where did you meet the Jesuits? I'm at the Jesuits in Philadelphia. So I am from uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey originally, and I was a public school kid, but my parents were insistent for myself and my siblings. They wanted us to go to a Catholic uh, high school. Uh, that was an experience they had, and they wanted to share with us that same experience. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know what a Jesuit was. I didn't know there were flavors of Catholicism, um, as one of my friends has put it in the past. Uh, I, I just knew, all I knew about this school, it was St. Joe's Prep in Philadelphia. Uh, we have a lot of St. Joe's Prep kids here at Fairfield U. I knew it was a good school. Um, and yet, uh, when I came in, I started to learn that there was something distinct about this place. And, uh, you know, it was, it was everything. Right away, learning about Jesuit history and spirituality from a freshman year theology teacher. Um, but then it kind of took on a life of its own from there. Oh, Jerry, I think we're, you're muted. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, when you look back at your high school years at St. Joe's Prep, what really stands out? What, what would you say was the gift of your high school years? I know you were involved with lots of extracurriculars, and at the same time, 
uh, you were involved in service programs and in academics. What did you take away from St. Joe's Prep that you that still remains of lasting value for you? Yeah, well, you know, it, it was this love of the society. And I always say there were, there were I mean, right from the get-go. So the, the, the first thing that comes to mind was um, St. Joe's Prep is in North Philadelphia, which to this day is, a, is an economically depressed area. Uh, and I remember when I was in middle school, my dad taking me over and saying, you know, we're going to check out this place. Um, the neighborhood is a little different from where we live. And, uh, you know, if that's uncomfortable for you. The thing is, what, what I realized when we got there was that was something um, the Jesuits wanted us to experience every day. And I was very lucky when I was a freshman, we were celebrating 150 years, ourselves and St. Joe's University. And so we had this incredible uh, experience. We had a visit from the, the, the Superior General in Rome. He's the head Father of the- Kolbenbach. Whole, Father Kolbenbach. Yeah, Father Peter Hans Kolbenbach, who, is, who was the mm -hmm. head of all of the Jesuits in the world. And I remember we were learning about him. In fact, like I remember a history teacher saying, we're getting a visit from the Black Pope, which was a, a name, a nickname for uh, the sort of, as some people thought the second most powerful Catholic in the world because he would dress like this, um, thus the Black Pope. And yeah, I thought, who is this guy? He came, it was an arousing occasion, a really big deal, we were told. And the thing that stood out to me that he said there was, uh, he, he took us through the history of the school school had been um, in different places in Philadelphia since its birth in 1851. Uh, and then in the 1960s, there was a horrendous fire that consumed most of the school. And uh, there was a decision at that point because the neighborhood had changed quite drastically. Um, it, had, it had grown uh, largely into uh, a, an economically depressed and because it was Philadelphia, a largely African-American neighborhood. And it's not too surprising, perhaps, that in the 1960s, there were a lot of calls by people to say, well, maybe we should leave this neighborhood. Maybe we should go someplace safer, which they, I think they meant out of the city. And we decided, no, the Jesuits said, no, this is exactly where we need to be. And this is exactly where we need to educate our students. And Kolbenbach commended us for that. And I just took that away as, oh, this is what these guys are about. It's not all for show. The, the, it was about what we call in the society, faith and justice, you know, merging together and meeting together. Um, that I would say was like the lasting effect. Uh, and it was all the other things too, the, you know, the intellectual rigor and, and the pursuit of excellence and things, the, the sense of community, um, the brotherhood. Uh, but that's the thing that stood out to me most, so much so that I knew when I was going to college, um, I wanted to go to a Jesuit university. That was wow. that very wow. much in my mind. Wow. And that, so it was this experience of, of demanding creative intellectual work, the brotherhood, as you say, community, yeah. uh, commitment to the city and to the community uh, and to a faith that does justice. And so you decided to hop on the train and come up to Fordham. Uh, yeah, I went to Fordham. Joined, I see a number of your fellow Rams uh, <laughs> uh, who are uh, also participating in today's event. Yeah. So, Brendan, when you got to Rose Hill, uh, what, what, how did you find that? Did you find that there was a real continuity? Uh, or how did you find yourself growing? I mean, there's, we all know that there's, as wonderful as secondary school is, major changes take place with the new freedom, the new opportunities uh, of being uh, away, from, away from home and being yeah. on the campus. What did you find yourself jumping into when you got to, uh, to the university, to, uh, to, to Fordham? Uh, I mean, first of all, I love New York, and I was embracing that. Um, my, my family is from New York, so the idea of a Jesuit university in New York just seemed too good to be true. So I was embracing that, uh, but I was also being challenged again. Um, I, I would say, like, one of the first things that happened was, you know, I remember taking a philosophy class for the first time in the spring of my freshman year. The, the, old, the, the old fear, dreaded uh, core curriculum yeah. on top of you. Yeah. Same thing here, too. And I'm sure we have guys yeah. who come in here and, and say the same, oh, I have to take this core curriculum. Didn't I do this stuff in high school? And, uh, and yet what I What found, did you take for your philosophy course? Well, it was, it was uh, I think we all had to take, it was uh, philosophy of human nature. Okay. And I was lucky enough, I had this fantastic grad student it was one of the only times I didn't have a full professor, and she was amazing. Uh, and 
she uh, not only introduced us to sort of the, the, the greats, you know, reading the, the Socratic dialogues or, or reading Descartes meditations, uh, but she was really into Kierkegaard. And I remember we wow. read like, Sickness Unto Death. As an 18 year old. Yeah. And, and it just was like earth shattering to me. And it was, again, it was just the Jesuits sort of pushing us into this, this new way of thinking. I mean, uh, what a privilege that was to be able to take philosophy. I mean, so much so that I decided I'm, I'm going to major in this. Like there's some, I remember my dad and mom were like, oh, what are you going to do with that? But it was, uh, <laughs> but they, they had trust and faith because they could see that this education was exciting something within me. Um, you know, it's funny from there, you know, that kind of, that shattered a lot of stuff. I remember when I was, when I left St. Joe's Prep, I, mem- I think I had in my mind, you know, mm-hmm. business or law. And suddenly I was thinking, no, maybe that's not it. You know, there was something about, again, the, the, the questions life, uh, yeah. or the unquestioned life, right? Well, now I wanted to question it. And um, it was that plus, again, experience. And so uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Dan Kasaki, who taught here at the university, he's on this call today. Uh, we were roommates at Fordham. And he had done a service project in his freshman year to Guatemala. Did he do global and, outreach? Did global, he do global outreach? Yeah. And again, our, our universities, as I'm sure they mm-hmm. have here at Fairfield, they have these incredible opportunities. And he said, you know, you should go on this. This would be a great opportunity. I think I was in my sophomore year slump. And I went on that experience. Well, after uh, Kierkegaard, anybody's entitled to be in a slump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I go. So I go. And, and the way it works, this program is so great. Mm-hmm. It still continues to this day. Because we didn't just like hop on a, a plane. We were meeting as a team. Mm-hmm. There were about a dozen of us. And we were meeting as a, as a team for months, learning about the culture, learning about the situation where we're going to be working at a Habitat for Humanity site. And we were learning about each other. We were meditating after each meeting and praying together. And uh, there was a Jesuit scholastic. So a guy kind of in my, he was a little bit, you know, before my stage now, studying philosophy there at Fordham, uh, who was our chaperone. He would be at those meetings. And then we go. And it was just an incredible experience. And I, I tease, I say, like, it's, yeah, it's a kind of cliche, like the white privileged boy goes to Guatemala to find himself. But you know, for me, here's what happened. First of all, I had an encounter with great community. I had an encounter with simple life. I had an encounter with faith that does justice again. But what really happened was this experience of all of it coming together. And I remember distinctly, it was like somewhere in the middle of the day, we were in this town, like on the border of El Salvador. It was February or March. I think it was more like March, but it was warm down there. And, and you know, we were working all day. I've got sweat and dirt all over me. And I climb into a van and I still remember like clear as day. One of my cl- teammates just saying to me, Brendan, you look so happy. And it's one of those moments that, I mean, it was like the voice of God knocking at me. It was startling. And immediately I realized, wow, they're, they have, they've spoken such a true thing. And I had to do a lot of digging about, well, why am I so happy here? And, and what is it about this experience? Um, where is it leading me? So, uh, you know, there it was again. It was kind of this. So this... what'd you come up with, Brendan? Hold on, hold on. What'd you come <laughs> up with? What did you come up with? What was making you so happy at that moment? I think it was, again, I mean, uh, these, these combinations of, mm. of simple living and, and, and working toward justice and doing it in a community and doing it in the context of faith. Uh, and I, you know, I distinctly remember having a, a conversation. I think I had missed Christmas or no, excuse me, Christmas. I'd missed Easter break. And uh, my parents came up to visit me and see you're here. You know, how was this? And they hadn't seen me. Um, and I remember saying, you know, I think I'm going to make some changes. I don't think I want to pursue law or business anymore. I think I want to live a very simple life. I think I want to be a teacher. Um, it was pretty shocking. I, I remember trembling saying that. And I think my parents were like, what on earth is going on? Uh, but they could see a, a sense of, of something going on in me. And, um, and so, you know, there, there, there was something sparked in that moment and from that experience. Brenda, did you connect at all uh, with, the, with Chiswick Hall? You know, we, our house of study for the young yeah. Jesuits 
who yeah, which doing is interesting because that's where I lived just before I came here to Fairfield. I was living okay. at, uh, the, the, right across from Fordham's campus is a building that is stacked with 20 some young guys who are studying philosophy. And I did meet those guys. Uh, I met a lot of them. Some of them, like I, I had, I had, I, I, I took a class from one of them. One of them was on the service project. Others you would just get to know um, through stuff related with campus ministry or the Ignatian Society. And one of the things I noticed about these guys was mm. uh, they are holy and they're intelligent. So, you know, all that stuff I expected from a Jesuit, but they were young and normal. <laughs> you mean like, unlike the older Jesuits, you know? Well, I, hadn't, I hadn't experienced that before. And, you know, it was much more relatable. Right. And, right. Uh, and not only that, I mean, these guys were funny. They were, they were incredibly entertaining. You'd see them out st- outside playing Frisbee. Um, you'd see them making jokes. Uh, but they were, they were attractive uh, in the sense of like, I didn't, I don't you know, I, the, the thought entered my mind to be a Jesuit. Yeah, sure it did. But at the very least, I was like, this is the kind of man I want to be. You know, there's something wow. joyful wow. and real about yeah. these guys. Yeah. Um, so that was part of the experience too, for sure. In fact, one of those guys was, was Father Paul Rourke, who I had met at uh, St. Joe's Prep. He had done uh, what's called a novice experiment in his second year as a Jesuit at my high school. And then he was at Chiswick Hall. He was the first one to welcome me to Chiswick Hall for dinner. Um, and mass. And uh, so, you know, imagine that a young Paul Rourke, it was kind of like oh, amazing wow. to see these guys and they were, they were filled with fervor and energy for wow. their life as Jesuits. Brendan, when I was at Fordham, it was, uh, it was very uh, typical. And in fact, we were, we were pushed if we possibly could to do a junior year abroad. I went to Germany, uh, but I think you would, you went to Ireland, right? Did you go to Trinity? I did. Yeah, I went what to was Trinity, that like? Dublin. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, I, I grew up, so both of my, uh, both sides of my family are thoroughly Irish, but we had been, our, our families, I should say, have been in America for a long time. Uh, like I did not have a relative, I did not have a grandparent or even a great grandparent who came over from Ireland. Um, but I had this, uh, joy of being Irish and, uh, we would celebrate that in our house. Um, and, and more than that, I was almost, there was almost like a mystical sense of it. And, uh, uh, if that makes sense, you know, a, a sense of identity that I wanted to get in touch with. Um, and the idea, I mean, when I was at Fordham and I found out we had a relationship with Trinity College Dublin, that was like, oh my God, that's incredible. I had never been to Europe before. I had rarely, barely left the country. Um, and uh, and uh, so I got on a plane and I went over to Ireland for a year. I studied philosophy and English and it was incredible. And did you uh, discover, great. what did you discover about, about being Irish? You know, a lot. And, and so, I mean, I went back there for graduate school. So I spent two years um, at Trinity and I did a graduate degree in, in Irish literature. So I was really studying characters right up front. And I was, I was seeing uh, characters that reminded me of family members, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and just a sense, what I found over there was a people who I mean, Ireland was going through a tough time economically and also with uh, the abuse crisis in the church. And I wrote about that in my master's thesis. I wrote about the sort of post-Catholic <laughs> Ireland. And I looked at Irish um, drama in particular. But what fascinated with me w- was this was a nation just saturated with spirituality, with, with uh, a, a, an interesting kind of Celtic Catholicism that just seeped into everything. And... I mean, if you read Joyce, you know, who, who kind of fights with the Catholic Church, but you can't read him without seeing that he is so thoroughly Catholic in his imagination. Mm. And that's what I found over there. And I realized, you know, there is something deep in the soul uh, of, a, of, of an Irish person that is kind of um, seeking that, that great spiritual depth. Uh, and I was, I was so intrigued by that. And I found it a, a beautiful thing. Um, I was kind of moved by it. That this was part of my identity too. To discover this this the spiritual depth that's almost intrinsic to uh, to being yeah. who you are. And I was like, I made great friends over there, and I couldn't escape the Jesuits. Uh, a Jesuit who was doing his <clears throat> tertianship, so sort of an experience post ordination, um, picked me up from the airport. Uh, he had, he was at Fordham when I was there, and so he kind of settled me in. Uh, and my closest friends, um, I wish they were the Irish, but were, were Americans from Holy Cross. Uh, so even over there, 
it was it was it was like uh, you know, this chance to maybe try and get someplace new and the jesuits were like no we're gonna still take a hold of you over there wow and it was great and it, what was also wonderful is those those mm. uh, folks from holy cross were almost by and large all women um and this was a great encounter for me had having gone to an all boys high school and not quite having experience with having great female friends i i was able to meet wonderful women who uh, were challenging to me um, uh, and who befriended me and who, who who were just, you know, like great sisters. Um, it was wonderful. It was a great experience. I'm still good friends with some of those folks today. Now, Brendan, you said that when you first got to Fordham, it didn't take long before you realized that neither law nor business were going to be your career paths for the future. Yeah. Um, and clearly you had a great experience at St. Joe Prep and at uh, and at Fordham and now at Trinity. Uh, how did you identify, uh, or how did you come to the conclusion that uh, when you were graduated and after you finished your master's that you were going to go back to second, that you were going to go to secondary school teaching? You know, teaching was something I, I had done in some summers between uh, kind of in, in college, especially. In fact, I did a summer here. We didn't talk about this. I did a summer here at Fairfield University teaching with Brooklyn Jesuit Prep. Um, yeah. and I did some summers like that at, at St. Joe's Prep, teaching for sort of a, a middle school. And there was just something about it that attracted me. And, and again, it's not that business and law are bad careers. I think I just was into them because it seemed, you know, a good place to make money and get prestige. Uh, and that's not a good reason to do either of those things. Um, what it was different about teaching when I had some limited experiences was I felt alive. Uh, I felt, felt like, alive. Yeah, I did. And so I had this experience, my high school, uh, like a lot of Jesuit high schools has this program called the Alumni Service Corps. And I was able to go back for a year and I taught English. I worked uh, in campus ministry. I did a lot of retreats. I did service projects with the kids. Um, uh, and it was a wonderful experience and a very confirming one for me so that I did go back to Trinity uh, in Dublin for a year to, to get uh, basically a credential so that I could really teach full time. Did you notice, by the way, viewers, when Brendan said, I became alive, you could see him become alive, even <laughs> on the screen. And I got to tell you that uh, uh, that's, that's verified uh, every day when Brendan comes home from school, and I'll see him back in our community. All you have to do is say, how was your day, Brendan? And no matter how tired or worn out, or no matter how uh, stressed he may have been, uh, he's alive, and you know, and you know that this is a place where he is flourishing and fully alive. Look at him. So uh, part of why it's such a joy, to, you know, to live with Brendan. He takes such immense gratification and delight in the lives of his students. Brendan, I, 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 I'm not supposed to be telling stories on you, but Brendan, when you were, uh, when was it, uh, when you were helping your students get their college essays together? and you were taking time working with each one of them. Yeah. It, I think for all of us in the community, uh, it, was, it was so gratifying and delightful to watch Brendan talk about these students, you know, with such delight, you know, with such uh, unguarded delight in the lives of these young people. So Brendan, uh, after, after you came back from Trinity, then uh, you, you had determined you were gonna do uh, secondary school teaching, yeah. And you ended up in San Diego. How'd that happen? Yeah, that was crazy. Uh, I, I think I, I started looking into teaching at you know, Jesuit high schools, um, but we have a pretty high standard, which is great. And I think I was a little too green. Uh, so I put my application into a couple of places and it didn't bite. And I was, you know, it was one of these, like, there were like, you know, you know listservs of places that were open and some of them were Jesuit schools, some of them Catholic schools. Uh, and I found an Augustinian school. I was so I was living in Dublin, and I found an Augustinian school. I knew the Augustinians growing up uh, outside of Philly, uh, Villanova. Sure. Uh, a lot sure. of my cousins went to one of my rival high schools, Malvern Prep, and uh, and they had a high school in San Diego. And I I thought this is crazy. And I still remember. I can hear one of my really good friends, another Brendan, uh, who went to Georgetown, another friend from grad school, and he said, uh, "What are you crazy, man? You're 25." or I don't think I was 25, I think I was like 23. He's like, you're 23 and it's a city on a beach. Just put your application in and see what happens. So I did. Uh, and I had two wonderful years. I lived on the beach um, uh, and I, I, it was an all boys Catholic school, which I loved. Uh, I, I would have been happy there. It was a little too far from home for me. Okay. Um, so I wound up coming East. 
Yeah, so uh, now, then you ended up at Regis. Yeah, what, I wound know, up teaching at Regis, what which that was, I mean, seriously, so, you know, mm -hmm. I go from, you know, right out of grad school, no one's quite given me a look because I'm a little too new and, you know, they clearly wanted me to get a couple of years of experience. And then I put my application in uh, one of the most premier high schools in America, and I thought there's not a chance. And mm -hmm you know, I'm going to get this. And, and there were a couple other op openings in other places on the East Coast. So I thought, all right, you know, maybe I'll have better luck. And they hired me at Regis. Uh, Regis, for those who don't know, is a Jesuit high school for boys in, in New York City. And it's entirely free. It's entirely tuition free. Which um, is what Ignatius always envisioned Jesuit exactly. schools should all be. And, 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 and entirely through the generosity of one woman who, who founded the school 100 years ago, Julia Grant. Um, so it was her vision uh, to give an opportunity. There were other, you know, great Jesuit schools, the Loyola School, Fordham Prep, uh, Xavier down in Lower Manhattan, mm -hmm. and they were, they were available, but she wanted an education for immigrant Catholic men, uh, young men, um, uh, who would never have been able to afford uh, such an education, and that's how Regis got started. So it was amazing um, to be there, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite a place. What was it? I mean, what, what, what shines out from your Regis experience? You had already taught, you know, yeah. in bits and pieces and various programs, and you had been teaching in San Diego. Uh, was there anything specific about Regis that was different? Well, I was back in the Jesuit world. Uh, okay. and, and even though I, I took a lot from the Augustinians, I really, I think the, what, the, what I gained from the Augustinian experience was they had a wonderful sense of community. Uh, <clears throat> that was really quite beautiful. And I thought they did that really well. Um, what I got when I came back into the Jesuit world and now I was teaching full time was, and I was teaching as an English teacher and I was a part of this unbelievable department. Uh, it, was, it was extraordinary. I, I mean, I, I call it my like second masters because I worked so hard because there was this standard of great excellence in teaching and learning and I knew I had been uh, the recipient of that in high school. Uh, and now it was, wow, this is what it looks like on the other side of the desk. And I worked real hard, um, which was great. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was tough too. And the standards were pretty high. And I was with some, some guys in my department who had been there for a few years and who were kind of at the top of their game. But they were so generous with me sharing ideas or giving me thoughts about things that might work or could work. Um, and I loved the students there too. They were, they, because they were going there for free, they didn't take that education for granted at all. They, they had a deep sense of gratitude. They would, th every day, they would thank you on their way out of class. Thanks for that. Wow. Wow. So wow. yeah, it was a pretty neat place to be. Wow. It's during this time, Brendan, I presume, that you make the decision that as much as you love teaching or not despite yeah. the fact that you love teaching, what intervened? Yes. Uh, to introduce you into doing something which not a lot of 28, 29, 30 year olds yeah. are doing. Uh, what possessed you, Brendan? No, it possessed uh, me. All right, you know, let's... at age, what were you, you know? Yeah. As, as somebody said recently, uh, nobody does this anymore. And yes. people had to be saying that to you. Oh, uh, absolutely. I remember someone what happened? You know, saying like a, a, a Jesuit classic saying to me, this is crazy. Um, so, so let's start it this way. I, you know, I, I had kind of, in my mind, made it here. I, you know, it was kind of a little bit of a joke. Here, here I was aiming for a simple life uh, of service and I'm living on the Upper West Side and Upper teaching Side. at this premier oh, okay. Jesuit high school. So it's a little bit of, uh, but, he, but you know, it was, it was an exciting place to be. I loved where I was living. I was surrounded by great friends. I was closer to my family and yet there was something missing. And I just knew there was it. something missing. There was something missing. And because uh, it was it was like, wait a second, this is what my society tells me I need to be happy. I have everything I was, you know, uh, everything I was supposed to be happy with, I had. And yet there was something missing. And, um, you know, I, I thought about that in, in lots of different ways. But uh, again, I so what happened was, I think I'm in my second year at Regis. And I find out from a Jesuit, Jim Krogan, uh, who, who was kind of the Ignatian identity guy there, that, that I could go on a retreat and Regis would pay for it. Uh, and, uh, and I'm talking about an Ignatian eight-day silent retreat. 
So has you uh, ever I done anything like that? No, my, and again, my friend, Dan, who's on here, he's the one who says, well, you should go to Weston, which is up in outside of Boston. Uh, it's this incredible, huge structure. And there was a great spiritual mm -hmm. master, this guy, Bill Berry up there. Now it's funny, I go up there and I, I don't have Bill Berry. I have another Jesuit by the name of Stephen Sanford as a director. And I'll tell you, I mean, I'm dead serious. I walked in there and, and who's on retreat with me? Like some elder nuns, a couple of priests, um, and I'm, I'm like, what am I doing here? I, this is crazy. I think I, I'm thinking. Nobody does this fun. anymore. <laughs> oh, no, I, I'm thinking this is it. Like, I, I'm finally losing it. And I, I, I said as much. I, I, like, remember going outside and on this long walk, and I'm thinking maybe, it, maybe I'm in the wrong spot. And I go to my director the next day, and I said, you know what? I don't think I'm supposed to be here. And he says, you are absolutely supposed to be here. God brought you here. Settle in. And I just was like, okay. Well, I did. And, uh, you know, I've talked about this a little bit. It's, it's a hard thing to talk about, except to say it was an amazing experience. It was an extraordinary experience. Um, when, you were on, when you were on a silent retreat, for, for one, there are no distractions. I was not even allowed to read anything. And you can't hide anymore. And in the silence, uh, when you're encountering God, it's all raw. And um, uh, here's, here's one way I would just talk about it. it. So I had been in a Jesuit high school. I had been in a Jesuit university. I had taught in one Jesuit high school. Now I'm teaching in a second Jesuit high school. And I remember going to my spiritual director in the middle of that week. And I said, you know, I know this stuff. You know, I, I love the society. I thought I understood the lingo and the spirituality and the history. And I knew nothing. And the World Cup was going on at that point. And he, so he had this like great analogy, like ready to go. He said, you know, it's a little bit like knowing the rules of soccer and then playing the game. And I was finally starting to play the game and it was life-changing. You know, it was, it was a life-changing experience. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So when you went back to Regis then, it was with an opening to see where God who had become so real to you might yeah. lead you next. It, it, it was, it was, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it's a nov so my novice director, you know, when I entered the society, he, he would have put it this way. He was like, you know, when, when, when something is good, take another step toward the good. And, and so I didn't leave that retreat saying, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be a Jesuit. That's not, that's not how I left it. I left it with my spiritual director on the retreat saying, you know, you should start spiritual direction when you go back to New York. So I did. <clears throat> Michael Bouton was my spiritual director, former uh, headmaster and president at Fairfield Prep. And it's after a few times of meeting, he says, you know, I'm not pushing anything, but you keep talking about a vocation. And it was something that was percolating. Uh, and now it wasn't suddenly so crazy anymore. And it was like, well, why does this keep coming up? Why does this keep coming up? And even my parents, I remember, said, you know, what's up with you? you? You seem so happy and alive, you know, not that you weren't before, but we noticed you were, you know, kind of trying to find yourself. What's going on now? And I say it was like, it was as though I was in love. Um, it was like the beginning of something new. And the more I, I entered into the possibility of joining the society, the more I was excited by it. And it's a crazy application process. I mean, no one would go through this insane application process unless tell you the, dude, tell 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 our no. Friend, I mean, the, like the the one seven hour interview, the five other interviews you have to do, the psychological review, the doctor's visits, the dentist, the eye doctor, like writing a twenty page mm. spiritual autobiography, the background checks, which went even over to Ireland, to like insane amounts of information you have to give. I mean, it's like nothing I've ever been through before. Um, but each step of the way, as I'm applying, uh, I'm thinking, wow, yeah, I'm getting more and more excited about this. Um, yeah, it was, it was a wonderful gift to me. And Your I could see myself like coming I mean, alive in the classroom and mm -hmm. the kids knew something was up. I wasn't telling them what was going on. It was later on. They were like, you know, we knew something was up. We just didn't know what it was. They were Is kind of right? when I told them. They picked up this enthusiasm, this buoyancy. Yeah. yeah. Brendan, I want to make sure, since so many people know you from your time here uh, at Fairfield Prep, uh, I'm going to bracket for a minute uh, your, your early Jesuit formation. We can go back to it if we have time. 
but I wonder whether you can say a little bit about uh, what it's been like for you to be here at Fairfield Prep. As you say, you had taught at St. Joe's, you taught uh, in San Diego with the Augustinians, you taught at Regis, um, but clearly your being here at Fairfield Prep is incredibly, again, life-giving, and uh, joy inspiring for you. What, what's, what's this been about for you? It's been like the dream come true, you know, because it's, it's the thing that I loved when I was at Regis, except now the missing part isn't missing. And I had some Jesuits who said, well, why, don't, why do you want to do a Regency at a high school? Do something else. You've already done that. And I said, I haven't done it as a Jesuit. And that's where my prayer was pulling me in, into this direction of coming and uh, when I heard about Fairfield Prep, I thought, wow, this could be great. Um, you know, the, the, what, I, the, what I knew about it just seemed like a really good fit. And I'm, I've fallen in love with the place, uh, as, as people know. I mean, I, I know you guys get sick of me talking about it. Because Not at all. Not it's at a all. special place. Um, and I love What's it. What's so because, special about it? By the way, well, Jeff, if, you want, if, if you have in mind, if as you listen to Brendan, uh, or as you've thought back over what he said, if you have some questions, Jess, if, are you there? You can send them to Jess, okay? Yep, I'm here. Okay, so send them to Jess and uh, uh, hopefully we'll have some time before uh, we're finished so that Brendan will have a chance to, uh, to address your questions. But yeah. Brendan, it's a very special place. So what in the world is so special about Fairfield Prep? So, I mean, the kids are the best and they, they, the they best. talk about the sense of brotherhood and they are, they're wonderful. Uh, they, they so enjoy being together. Um, this year during the pandemic, right, we're, we're doing a hybrid um, experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have half the kids in the school and half are, are Zooming in at home and they're wearing masks and we're, 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 we're socially distancing, which is, which is what we should be doing to keep everybody safe. But I have to say my favorite part of the year uh, so far was being a cross country coach. Because after school, the kids would come outside and they'd be out and they'd be ready to go and they'd be joking with one another. And when they're running, they didn't wear a mask because, you know, we, they were distanced enough and they're running outside. And it was like, ah, this is what it's about. You know, it's so normal. Um, they just wanted to be with each other so much. And they, you see them smiling and coming to light. Even the parents said, you know, like, oh, thank God for this. You know, thank you for, for coaching uh, to myself and the other coaches because our kid comes to life. Um, so the, the kids are great. The other thing that I love about it though, and maybe the thing I love about it the most is uh, I love being a Jesuit and I love our mission and what we're about. It's all the stuff that I talked about, the, the intellectual rigor, the, the faith that does justice, um, the sense of excellence, the sense of community, the sense of simplicity um, and what we're about. And uh, I'm in a school where uh, it, there is such a, a, a fervor for that mission, and it's not a superficial fervor. I live, um, I work with incredible colleagues, and we have this incredible leadership team, which for the first time in the school's history is all lay, um, but they understand and have bought into our mission so thoroughly. Uh, and for me, that is incredibly exciting to see. And I've been sent to, 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 to Fairfield Prep not to to form, but to be formed. And it has been an incredibly formative experience and an incredibly hopeful one that um, the work that has been happening at all of our institutions, including here at Fairfield U, uh, has been about this future when there will be less of us. And that's just the reality. But the, the, the glass half full is, um, there is so much more engagement from our late colleagues and faculty, and, uh, and that's been amazing to see and to be a part of. Brendan, I didn't, I didn't ask you uh, about this when we were talking and preparing a little bit, but um, what have been the challenges for you? And I don't, you know, I'm not asking you to entrust us with more than we have the right to hear um, or that you want to share with us. But um, in this society where by and large, what you're doing is regarded as pretty crazy. Um, and in a society that is aging, um, yeah. by, by far, Brendan, you're the youngest person in our community. And honest to God, I don't know how you put up with this so much as, 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 as wonderfully as you do. What, what are the challenges that you faced and where do you think these have been uh, growing, growing points for you? 
Yeah, you know, it, it is like life in community is tough. And that's not just true because of the older population of our community. Um, that's true in any community. Life in community is hard. And I imagine it's probably the same as being married, even to somebody that you love. I mean, it's it's tough to, to exist in that. I, I think it's an incredible opportunity, though. I mean, I think living in community kind of holds a mirror up to yourself and to your limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it's been a great, I mean, that, that's been the, the great growing. I mean, especially now, I mean, we laugh a little bit about it, but we're, we're like kind of in lockdown mode as Jesuits because we live with a, a vulnerable population. So I have some friends who I know get together and it would love to see me. Um, I, I can't quite do that. Uh, and I'm not going you know, to make that uh, you know, I, I'm willing to make that sacrifice for, for our community. It's an important thing to, to do for each other, but it's, um, it's not easy. Uh, uh, but there are great graces, you know, Ignatius was so wise that, you know, it really does come down to the experiences. And if you're not paying attention to the ways in which God is operating in those experiences, um, you're missing out on a lot. And uh, that's hard to do. It takes a lot of humility um, and patience, but it's, uh, it's filled with gold if you, if you dig up what's going on, um, just even from a day-to-day -day experience. Brendan, thank you very much. Okay. Just, just do we have some questions from folks? Otherwise, there are a couple of other things that I would be happy to ask Brendan to speak about, but uh, have people registered some questions that we they'd like to hear Brendan? One question from Harry Rosetto, he's one of our alumni, and he'd like to know, is teaching now that you are a Jesuit different than it was at Regis? Great you know, question. that is a great question because I have been asked that and mm. it does feel that way. You know, in some cases, you know, the nuts and bolts are the same, but I notice, um, the kids look at me differently than before. Uh, and it's cool. Right now I'm teaching mainly theology. I do have an English class, but I'm mainly teaching theology, which I wasn't thrilled about at first, to be honest. And then I found like, I love it because I was, I had just studied theology before I came here and I found out, wow, I really enjoy doing this. And um, there is something cool about the fact that uh, when I'm talking about this, they're aware on some level that I've, I've made this choice with my life. And so it comes with a little bit of authenticity and integrity, I guess. And not that my lay colleagues in the department don't have that too. I have incredible colleagues in the theology department, and I think they also come at it. But there is something, um, I think they're aware there. There's, there's, I'm, I'm part of a link, if mm -hmm. I would put it that way. I'm a part of a link. And... Uh, and that is an incredible responsibility. It's, uh, it's also an incredible honor and opportunity to show them um, what does it mean to, to commit uh, to a life like this um, or any life, as I say, you know, I, I tell them all the time, like any, any choices they may, they, ha they have crazy questions for me as a judge. Every now and then they come out, the crazy questions about, so what did you do with your life? Why, why are you doing this? And, uh, but what an opportunity. And, and again, an opportunity to talk about what is commitment about and relationship and responsibility? And how does God fit into all this? And I get to have those questions because I wear this. So that's kind of neat. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about what your what are your next steps before you are ordained? Yeah. Uh, the <clears throat> saddest thing of all is I have to leave Fairfield Prep at some point. And no, I, I, we, we are petitioning to get Brendan <laughs> ordained at the end of the year so he can just stay. He knows enough theology. So I don't, not yet. Uh, I, have, I have like three more years of theology after this. Um, Jesuit formation is, is a crazy long experience. Uh, I know some people are like, why does it take? I think it's brilliant. I think Ignatius was brilliant, you know, um, and he did this. This is how it's been for 500 years when life expectancy was not quite what it was now. Uh, and he, I, I think he, you know, we become Jesuits after, mm -hmm. after two years of being in the novitiate. And, uh, and then we, um, <laughs> and then we, uh, uh, we, we become Jesuits and, and, and we start our studies and smack in the middle, we get this experience. So yeah, I have three more years of theology. I don't know where that will be yet. Um, 
uh, lots of stuff on the, on the horizons. Um, but I'll be ordained a deacon about nine months advance of being ordained a priest, God willing. Uh, and that's really exciting, I'll be honest. Um, I think originally I came in, uh, wanted to be a Jesuit, and the priest thing was sort of like, okay, well, let's see. Now I'm so excited to be a priest. I'm just so excited for it. Uh, and I can see already, again, like these opportunities I have with students and colleagues. It's like, ah, I wish I, wish I had this. Um, that's a good sign, so. Brendan, one of the questions that's just come in is uh, uh, one of our participants is asking, have you had and will you have the opportunity to have experience of diverse kinds of ministry? So maybe say a little bit more about the experiments and, uh, yeah. and what you would anticipate. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. Um, yeah, especially in, in our novitiate uh, and, and, and Father Jerry knows this well, he was a novice director for many years up at Syracuse where I was a, a novice. Um, and uh, those were incredible years. When you enter, you know, it, it is like, oh, here it is. Like, I did this. This is kind of nuts. Uh, and you do it with, I did it with seven other guys, and there were already 10 guys living there in their second year. Um, I had a wonderful novice director. Some of the things I did uh, that I thought would never, I would never do in a million years, I worked um, not once, but twice in a hospital. Uh, which I was a guy who hated hospitals, um, even though I have a mom who was just until recently an ICU nurse. Uh, and one of those experiences, we, we, we worked in Calvary Hospital in the Bronx as orderlies with terminally ill patients. Mm -hmm. So I did not dress like that, I dressed in, in scrubs. Um, and for six weeks, every day, for a full day, went in, uh, tending to people's wounds, cleaning them, uh, wrapping up dead bodies. Uh, incredible experience. Um, I didn't just work in schools like this. My, my, my last five months, almost as a Jesuit, I worked at a Christo Ray school in, uh, in Baltimore, which was an incredibly different experience and very challenging, um, also deeply enriching. Uh, so, I mean, those are, you know, I worked at a, a, this place called the Spiritual Renewal Center, which worked with adults. It was kind of a Murphy Center for Syracuse, um, and I did like Bible study with some of the adults there. I led some retreats. Um, so, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to get different experiences uh, uh, along the way, um, and that's been enriching. Uh, and also, you know, learning Spanish, that's been a big part of it too. So I've spent time in San Antonio for a few weeks. I was in Mexico for a couple of months over one summer. Um, a couple summers ago, I was in Berkeley, California, learning about spiritual direction. Uh, at our school of theology out there. Um, that's been one of the neatest things is, you know, I have friends and family who are like, God, we want your life. You, you get to go to these amazing places, have these incredible experiences. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, when, when Brendan is talking about the novitiate and the experiences, um, going back to the 16th century, one of the things that made the Jesuits suspicious in the eyes of our critics and made us quite different from anything that had come before uh, as a form of religious life. St. Ignatius, the, the old monastic orders felt that the way you formed somebody was uh, put them in a monastery, uh, let them live with the rhythm of prayer, and, that, and, the, and the rule of the monastery will make the monk. Yeah. Ignatius said what will make a Jesuit is experiences. And so Ignatius looked at the experiences that he uh, himself and others had found um, transformative. And uh, Ignatius said, okay, if somebody wants to be one of our number, the way that we'll validate, the way we'll test to see whether they have that grace and the way we'll form them at the same time is to have them willy-nilly replicate the key experiences that made the first generation of Jesuits. And one of those that Brendan mentioned uh, was, uh, was working uh, as orderlies, uh, doing the simple, ordinary work of caring for the sick and the dying. Ignatius believed that was transformative, and I think it always has been. It's always been a part of, uh, of Jesuit formation. And then, you know, later on after Brendan's ordained, he'll do what we call the tertianship, uh, which is yet another experience of the 30-day retreat and um, all different kinds of other pastoral experiences that he hasn't had up till now. So that's also waiting for Brendan before he takes his final vows. Yeah. So even though, you know, we love Brendan and we'd love to have him at Fairfield Prep, 
uh, speaking as an old novice master, if anyone came into the society and said, I've, I've joined the order in order to be a high school teacher, I'd say, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you so know, uh, right. but if you have if you have your heart set on that and can't imagine yourself doing anything else, we're probably not the group for you. That's right. You know, because the principle of Jesuit life is availability. If there's any, or Ignatius called it disponibilidad. Are you disposable? Are you available to go where there's the greatest need uh, as it's discerned by the religious community whom you believe God's providence has made you a part of? Yeah. But they're here to listen to you, not to me, Brendan. No. Uh, any more questions? John wants to know if you run with your kids during the cross-country season. I do. Uh, not all the time, um, but I do, especially early on, uh, to make sure they don't get lost. Um, <laughs> that's important. Uh, we may have had one incident about that once. but uh, I didn't bring uh, that up either. <laughs> but it's... Uh, no, I love it. Um, and I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I use it as an opportunity because there were some kids that I had had, you know, in class, you know, and then they were running with us this year and I'm, I'm like huffing and puffing and, and, you know, uh, and they're behind me and I'm like, I am twice your age and a, and a male religious. Come on, you should be ahead of me at this point, you know, so it's a little way to, to get them uh, to, to put in a little more effort, but no, it's a great joy um, doing that kind of stuff with the guys. Any more questions? No, I think that's it. All right. Brendan, maybe one last question from me. Sure. Um, when you look uh, at the lives of, our, of your students, mm -hmm. what do you hope for for them, Brendan? What's, what do you long for for them great at question. this time? It's a great question because I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think I told you this. One of the things I reflect on, I was reflecting recently, like the things that I want to teach them the most, I can't. Uh, and what I want, I think what I want is the, the same experience I had. I want them to come alive to themselves, mm -hmm. whatever that means for them, right? Because mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all sort of given a mission um, by God, I believe. And it's our, it's, it's our work, sometimes our lives work to figure out what that mission is. But once we come to understand that, we come to understand who we are. And, uh, and I think that's something that we do really well. I think that's what our education is about. Um, it's always experiential, right? It's about giving, giving people experiences uh, that will unleash uh, that will free them of the mission that they've been given and thus give them the sense of identity that will be the fulfillment of their lives and the flourishing of their existence and their being. Um, I want everybody to have that experience. Uh, I think I told you this the other day, when I came back from my spiritual exercise, my 30-day silent retreat as a novice uh, in my first year, and I, I got on the phone with my mom after 30 days of silence, how was it? First question. And I just told her, I said, I wish everybody could experience what I just experienced. Um, that kind of encounter with God, uh, however we find it, however we uncover it, um, that's what it's all about. Brendan, you are a joy and an inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you both so much. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. And we wish you all a wonderful and healthy Christmas season.